title of the first message this morning is The Second Coming of Jesus. And then, of course, the question is, for us or with us? This is a tricky question because for the most part, most Christians on planet Earth either don't teach that there is a literal coming of Jesus back, or they teach that the church is here waiting for Jesus to come back. Do you understand? That's the main, main teaching. In fact, what triggered me to teach on this message is a sermon or a, a, a remark made by a Filipino pastor in a huge church in the Philippines that said to his people, we must get ready for the second coming of Jesus. And you know what? It's not a bad thing to say by itself, but the question is, and I'm thinking to myself, is it that we must be ready for his second coming? Or we must be ready for our gathering to be with him? And that's the question, for us or with us? And what is the definition of the second coming, basically? So, first of all, as I said, there is a great, great confusion. And 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, and in all the churches of the, as is in all the, churches of the saints. So, there has to be very, very, very clear Thing that uh, from this pulpit this morning in the word of God there's no confusion certainly not regarding Jesus's return and the, re, the, the confusion is actually from the pulpits of both churches and let me even add synagogues <laughs> you're probably going to ask me what do you what are you talking about synagogues I'm going to say to you that the Jewish people not just the Christians the Jewish people are still waiting for their Messiah as well. And they are awaiting his coming. And they are not sure when it's going to happen. But they say, we will wait until he comes. The problem with the Jewish theology is that they completely ignore the Dozens of prophecies in the Old Testament co concerning the first coming of Jesus. And they are only thinking and praying and hoping for him coming in the second coming. And they call it the first coming and the only coming. The Jews are not praying or hoping for a second coming of the Messiah. But in reality... The biblical second coming of the Messiah to earth is what the Jews are waiting for. To come and reign here on earth. So they skip the first coming and they go directly to the second coming. And this is why in Matthew 23 verse 37, Jesus, when he was riding the donkey, as he entered into Jerusalem... Remember, he saw the city and he wept. And he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you children, uh, your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. You were not willing. You had your mind fixed on one thing and that's I'm going to have to come on a white horse and that's that I'm going to have to come as a king that destroys all of his enemies and all of your enemies and that's that I will have to come and sit in Jerusalem and reign over all the world and that's that there will have to be a world peace and prosperity you just did not want to accept all the words of the prophets that spoke of my coming to save you from yourself. And that is why Jesus lamented over that city that way. But as I said, not only that there is a Jewish confusion, there is also a Christian confusion. They, 
this, the confusion is related to a single reason, which is what? They either skip the rapture or don't believe that there is such a thing. They don't teach that, they don't believe in it, or they think it's too fantastic, and they don't take it literally the way they take other things literally. You know, one of the things that I keep hearing from pastors around the world, and they even quote other pastors and other theologians, is Paul didn't believe in the rapture, neither did Jesus, neither should you. For example, this is what, uh, in theology by Kurt Willems May, uh, what he wrote on May 9th, 2017. And this is the thing that triggered me to, to put together this message because I believe as Bible students, you need to understand that there is a great distinct, uh, distinction between the rapture and the second coming. These are not the same events in the Bible. And uh, the first distinction, the first thing that you can clearly see that is different, the rapture is when we meet the Lord in the air versus the second coming when we come with the Lord back on earth. These are two different things. And of course, you all know in the rapture, believers are going to be taken up, pulled up, and meet the Lord in the air. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be, and then comes the word harpazo in the Greek, caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord, where? In the air. The meeting point of us, the believers that are here today with Jesus, is not when He comes back to earth, but it's our meeting with Him, where? In the air. And it says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Which means, the minute we meet Jesus in the air, anywhere Jesus goes, we're with Him. You understand? If He's right there in heaven with us, we're with Him. If He returns back to earth, we're with Him. You understand? Anywhere He is. Because from that moment, we shall always be with the Lord. In the second coming, the believers will return with the Lord. As Zechariah 14, the latter part of, of verse 5 says, Thus the Lord my God will come, and all His, or all the saints with you. When Jesus returns to earth, and Zechariah 14 describes that His feet will stand on Mount of Olives, the Bible also says He's not coming alone. He's coming with all the saints. In Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, and even they who pierced Him. And look, look what He says. And all the tribes on the earth will mourn because of Him, even so, Amen. And the armies in heaven, in Revelation 19, 14, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed Him on white horses. When Jesus makes His way back on earth, we will follow Him on white horses. We will be seeing His back, not His face. If you're a believer, and you sit here right now, and you want to tell me that you want to see Jesus' face when He comes back to earth, there is only one option left for you, and that's that you were never raptured. The believers in the second coming of Jesus to earth should not see Jesus' face. They should see Jesus' what? Back. Because they are going to what? Ride he, the horses following Him. Follow me. Follow Him. That's what it is. 
Jesus becomes your leader when you follow him. Here on earth, he said to the disciples, follow me. And even in heaven, and even in the second coming upon his return, we always are to follow him. You understand that? The second thing is, that you have to understand is, the rapture of the church has to happen before the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus to earth has to happen after the tribulation. The Bible is very clear about those things. The tribulation is a future seven years period when God will complete His discipline of Israel and final judgment upon the unbelieving citizens of the world. It's not yet the judgment of the individuals, all the individuals that ever lived on planet earth. We're talking about the world as is at that time and the rapture will happen before the tribulation. How do I know that? Because in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 10, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with Him. Just like 1 Thessalonians 4 said, whether you are dead in Christ or you're still alive, you will all be living with Him when he comes to take us to be with him. And we're not appointed to the wrath of God. Daniel the prophet, when he described the last week of the 70 weeks, that week of the terrible great tribulation, called the entire week Za'am in Hebrew, which is wrath in English. And we are not appointed to that wrath. In Revelation 3.10 Jesus says to one of the churches, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you, now watch the word, from, ek in the Greek, from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The Seven years tribulation will begin with an hour of trial. Will you choose this guy as your Messiah and end up with a great tribulation at the very end with the, the, the trouble of Jacob and all of that? But this is something that we're not destined to, that we're going to be taken out of. We're not part of. The second coming will happen at the end of the tribulation. In Revelation 19, he says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, and of those who sit in them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. If we are on earth, how in the world the Antichrist is going to fight us, which are the army that comes behind Jesus? You understand, as we come back, Jesus riding his white horse, and we are coming riding, riding our white, white horses, the armies of the world will actually, I mean, the Antichrist will try to obviously make war against him and against us who are his army. You understand that? 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven... Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath, what? To come. He will deliver us from the wrath to come. It's very important that you get, get the right t uh, context in the Greek and in the Hebrew when you look into past, present, and future tenses. And so we are definitely going to be taken 
to be with him before the wrath and throughout the wrath we are with him and at the very end when he comes back to establish his kingdom we come back with him that's important now the third important thing that you want to know is that there is deliverance which is the rapture and there is judgment when the second coming is coming is happening two things in the rapture believers are taken from the earth by God as an act of deliverance this is why our days are likened in the scriptures to be like in the days of Noah when everybody did whatever they want only the believers are they know what's coming <laughs> We know how much we need to prepare ourselves. In fact, that's what we're doing right now. Studying this in order to prepare ourselves. We are, in a sense, building our own ark. The world, in a sense, is ridiculing us for what we do. But we know that when it comes, and when the rapture will be there, in fact, we are going to be lifted up in order for that flood of wrath that is coming over the earth not to swipe us and take us with it. And so in the rapture, the believers are taken from the earth by God as an act of deliverance. It is important that you know that throughout scriptures, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back for us, he comes to what? Not for the issue of sin anymore, but for what? For salvation of the body for the redemption of the body just as Romans 8 says in John 3 17 look what it says everybody likes to quote John 3 16 and it's nice and understandable but John 3 17 says for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved but then in John 14 3 he said and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and what? Receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said in the most beautiful prayer in John 14, 15, and 16, he said, I am going to prepare a place for you and I'm coming to take you. And Jesus knows that he's going to the Father. He knows that he's going to be separated from the church for a, for a while. He says, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I have to go because I have to prepare a place for you. But when I come back, I want to take you to the place that I prepared for you. You understand? Jesus never said, I want you to prepare a place for me so I will come back to you. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you so you will come to be with me. It's a big difference, and we see that throughout the, today in other messages because one of the biggest teachings worldwide today that is afflicting the church is that the mandate of the church today is actually to prepare the world for Jesus' coming. Whereas Jesus said, I prepare a place for you, so I will come and take you to be where I am because I'm going to deal with this world and you are not destined to that dealing at all. In the second coming, unbelievers are removed from the earth by God as an act of judgment, not of deliverance. You understand? In the second coming, when Jesus comes and when people are going to suffer from the judgment, remember, he's not coming as a loving turning to the, the other cheek, uh, wonderful uh, 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 savior on a, on a donkey, crying over the confused Jerusalem. No, Jesus will come as a man of war. This, uh, it's one thing Christians have a hard time with. But Jesus, for the first time, came not to condemn but to save. But the second coming is completely different. Jesus will consume all of his enemies and he will sit there and reign from Jerusalem. And this is exactly what, unfortunately, the Jews are fixing their eyes on only. They're fixing their eyes only on the judge that will come and destroy their enemies and will establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. They completely ignore the part that he had to come first to die for their sins. And yet we see 
there's two different things. The rapture, where we are delivered. The second coming, when removal of people will be actually for judgment. Revelation 19, 20 to 21. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. You know, a lot of people think that uh, hell, or whatever you call the place where non-believers eventually those who reject Christ will end up in, they, 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 there's this whole concept of secession, which means once you go to hell and Jesus makes all things new, new heavens, new earth, even hell will cease to exist, secession. You're gone. Boom. You evaporate. No. The Bible says the opposite. You wish you could die. They were sent alive, cast alive into the lake of burning with fire were burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed in the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Terrible, terrible scene. This is not what God is preparing for us. This is not what we are destined for. You know, one of the amazing hopes that we have, that blessed hope, that we're destined for eternal life. That we're destined to the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That we're destined to the presence of God that is holy and beautiful. And certainly not that. These people will reap what they sow, basically. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. That's Jesus and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dripped in, in, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who is the Word of God according to John chapter 1? Jesus. And the Word became flesh and came and dwelt among us. And it's the same Word of God that is coming now back to the world. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. Who are these? All of us. The armies of heaven clothed in fine linen. Look, angels don't need to put customs on them. Angels don't wear fine linen. We wear fine linen. You understand that? And it says that the armies, that w what happened with them? White and clean, they followed him on white horses. And look what it says. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with, with it he should strike the nations. You know, and you're probably going to say, this is pretty gruesome description of Jesus. I, I don't think this is the Jesus I know. L let me tell you something. When all of us are going to be out of here, the world is going to fall into such horrific, diabolic, satanic practices, set of practices, that trust me, a righteous judge knows what he's doing when he destroys them. It's like, uh, I'm going to try and give you an illustration. Imagine to yourself a group of 12 ISIS terrorists on their way and then you surprise them as and I'm sorry for the terrible analogy but I just want you to understand you surprise them you open the door and you surprise them in the middle of killing raping slaughtering and beheading people what are you going to do with them What happened to General Soleimani? Did we wait for him to land and ran with an olive branch and hugged him and said, Mister, please stop killing thousands of thousands of people? No, he got what he deserved. I have the pictures you don't want to see, trust me. From a tall, strong man, what's left is less than the content of your bag. You don't want 
to find yourself in that judgment. And the, the, the Bible says that he will strike those nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierce, fierceness uh, and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh and name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And trust me, you do not want to live here in this world throughout the great tribulation and, and experience the things that are going to be done. What you hold as a horrible crime, as a horrible atrocity, the world will hold as a good practice in those days. Jesus has to come back and put an end to all of this. Another thing that you, that is a big difference between the rapture and the second coming is that the rapture is hidden. It's hidden. The people around us will not see it happening. We will be gone how fast? Boom! In a twinkling of an eye. All of us, let's, let's twinkle with our eyes. That's how fast. You understand? We'll be gone. Nobody around us will even understand where we are. It's not like they will see him coming and we will go like Mary Poppins but, uh, but upwards and everybody. No. We'll be translated into eternity. We'll be translated into the heavenly realm with our new body. The Bible says that our body as is, as good as you may look and as fit as you may be and as healthy as you may be, cannot enter heaven. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us may die or sleep, but all of us will change. And how? The same way Paul describes to the Thessalonians the rapture. At the trumpet, quickly, in the twinkling of an eye, and so, when we are taken, the world will actually not see anything, but boom, we're gone. And in a way, believe it or not, the world is going to celebrate. Whew, finally, we can do whatever we want without these people telling us it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. Without telling us, God will judge you, God will judge you. Good written. Get out of here. The Bible says that when the restrainer is removed, then the Antichrist shows his true face. And then he will rule and everybody will fall into that lie. But the second coming of Jesus, something else. So again, the rapture according to the scriptures will be an insta instantaneous hidden event. First Corinthians 15, as I said, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Look, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. The world, as far as the world is concerned, will not understand anything. Will not see anything. But the second coming, according to the scripture, will be seen by everyone. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with what? The clouds and what? Every eye will see him. And they, even they who pierced him. Who are they who pierced him? Who are the people that the prophet Zechariah says, they looked upon him whom they pierced? Israel. So he says, everybody, the whole world will see it. Even the people of Israel will see him. And all, say all. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Another important difference between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus is that the rapture can come at any moment. There's nothing that has to happen before the rapture. How do I know it? I know it because, I know it because both Paul to the Thessalonians and to Titus wrote things concerning the imminency of the, of the rapture. When Paul described the rapture to the 
church in Thessaloniki in Greece, Paul said, the dead in Christ will rise, and then he didn't say, and those that are going to live in those days are going to be taken alive. No. He said, we, that are alive and remain, we. Paul was convinced that the rapture can happen even at his lifetime. And by the way, may I say, that's the type of life we should all have. Convinced, hoping, praying, and more so longing for the rapture to happen in your lifetime. If you live with the attitude, oh, it's going to take five, ten years. You know what? You're going to be likened to those five virgins that didn't have oil in their lamps. And then when the bridegroom came, they were not ready. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's how we should be living, looking for His appearing. By the way, the word appearing in the Greek implies that He's not coming for, for per permanently. He's appearing. He appears in the heaven. We're going to be with Him. It's not the second coming. But the second coming won't happen until certain events take place. This is why the book of Revelation described all the events before the return of Jesus back on earth when he rides the horse and his army, all of us, dressed with fine linen, ride just behind him and follow him. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 speaks of a certain man who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That, of course, is telling us two things. First of all, it tells us there is going to be a world leader that is going to feel more powerful, more worthy, and, 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 and more, uh, uh, you know, um, I guess, um, and stronger than in anybody else around. But not only stronger, and not only worthy, and not only powerful than men, but he actually, above that is called God, or is that worship? He says, there is nothing that is worshipped. That is above me, he says. I am above all that is worshipped. Therefore, he, s he will sit as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That never happened yet. It will happen when a third temple will be built in Jerusalem. And the Jewish people will worship God in what they call the house of God. And he will enter into that house of God and tell the Jews, I am God. And when the Antichrist will declare himself as God, guess what's going to happen to the Jewish people? What do you think the Jewish people are going to say? Welcome? Or you are not God. <laughs> See, the Jewish people have a problem with someone that looks like a man that claims to be God. We've established that 2,000 years ago. And so, the moment the temple is completed, the moment there is going to be house of God, he deceived them. For the, la for the first three and a half years, he deceives them. That he's loving Israel. He loves Jerusalem. He loves the God of Israel. He allows them to build a house for the God of Israel. And the moment comes when he will show his true face. He'll flip. And he will say, okay, there is no God. I am God. Worship me right now. And they're, they're going to flee. They're going to run away. They're going to they're, they're gonna be so scared. And God, the Bible says in Je Revelation 12 will preserve them and prepare a place for them for exactly the remainder of the seven years, for 1260 days, which is exactly three and a half biblical years 
when they will be sheltered until Jesus comes and brings them back and rule over them once they accept him as Messiah. Matthew 24, 19, 29 to 30, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Look, I've seen images of Mount Tal, of the volcano. I've seen images. They were amazing images. Some of the images were actually beautiful. Other images were scary. If you saw the image of the shopping mall with the unbelievable cloud of smoke and fire behind it, you would think that this is the end of the world. I saw a picture of a couple getting married. And the whole eruption is behind them. And he's happy, she's happy. He's probably saying to himself, this mother-in-law won't live too long now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for some people, those views were almost, that's the end of the world. Well, I can tell you one thing. Mount Ta'al is nothing compares. This is just the birth pangs. At the same time it erupted, another one in Japan and another one in South America, in Mexico erupted around the same 72 hours. And it's part of 25 eruptions over the last two weeks. These are the birth pangs. But when the time will come and Jesus will have to come back, the Bible says that the stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Not just the power, not only earth will shake. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. It's like you shake it and all the stars falling. <laughs> like they were hanging on a thread. And the Bible says that then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes on the earth will mourn. They're not going to be glad to see Jesus. <laughs> they will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with what? Power and great glory. Trust me, the only people that are going to be glad that Jesus is coming is Israel. Because he just kept them for three and a half years and he just rescued them from the wrath of the Antichrist. And he just brought them back to their land and they just saw the one whom they pierced. And they will mourn and cry, but this mourning and crying is their repentance. And thus the day of atonement is being fulfilled so they can be saved just as Paul wrote in Romans 11. Then all Israel will be saved. Revelation 6, 15, 17. And the kings of the earth. Look, I'm describing now all the politicians and all the wealthy industrialists that are running the world behind the scenes. George Soros. And all of his gang of the Rothschilds and, and the Rockefellers and all the others from Europe and all the others from even China. And the Bible says all those mighty men, but even every slave and every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountain and to the rock, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? You see, churches and pastors are selling you sometimes a wrong picture of the second coming of Jesus. Oh, the whole world, you know, it's, it's going to be beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, what's beautiful is our rapture, yes. What's beautiful is where we go, not what we leave behind. You know, Edsa is not going to be something you're going to miss as a road. What's beautiful is the place, you know, everybody's now running for money and for stones and precious stones and diamonds. and That's going to be our pavement in the New Jerusalem. We're, we're going to laugh at all of those things that people are just crazy, you know, are, are over here in this world. So my question is, do we really need to be ready for the second coming? Or what is it that is actually promised 
to the believers. Second Timothy 2 says, This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. And if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. The Bible says that what we need to look forward to is to him taking us out of here so when we come back with him, we will reign with him. That's our destiny. So what is the purpose of the second coming? In Isaiah 53 it says, But he who was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are all healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. With the, with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. So you understand Jesus is coming back to bring us back on earth. To rule on earth for a thousand years. Do you know how many times I was asking myself, Lord, why? Why are you taking me all the way up to heaven and seven years later you're telling me to return back to this earth? Why can't I stay there? I mean, I don't miss anything on earth. And it's very simple. The answer I had from the scriptures is basically I, I have to come back to rule here so the people of this world will see me ruling. And then when I finally judge all of them at the end of the millennial kingdom, there will be no more excuse because they've seen me, they were under me, there was no Satan around. He was in that bottomless pit. There was no poisonous snakes. There is no more uh, uh, unrighteousness over all around the world. And yet, when Satan will be released for a short while, they will join him. So when I judge them, I will judge them in righteousness. And so I thought to myself, but thousand years, isn't that a long time to just be stuck here again? And then I received the verse, for the Lord, a, a thousand years like what? One day and one day like thousand years. When we are being translated into our glorified bodies, I believe that time will be different for us. I believe it's going to go so fast for us, and it's going to be actually serving that purpose. Jude 15 to 17, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying behold the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him he's coming back to judge judgment is something that we're going to see later on today, even Job spoke of. And Job considered to be the earliest book ever written in the whole Bible. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, we saw it already. I saw that man riding his horse and, of course, eyes like flame of fire and on his head many crowns. We saw it already. And I have a question for you. Do we know when Jesus will return to earth? Do we know? I'm going to tell you a straight answer. Yes. But we don't know when it's going to start. We know exactly how much we need to count. We know exactly how many years, how many days, how many weeks. We know exactly. But it starts from the day of the rapture. And that one we don't know. And I want you to know that Daniel 9 is the key to the understanding of the return of Jesus. You all probably saw this before. I believe I taught here before.
before this uh, message on the 70 week of Daniel. But let me show you this chart, and you're going to see that Daniel received in his vision a time frame of 70 weeks that are determined upon his people and upon the city of Jerusalem. And Daniel was, all, was given a picture by the Archangel Gabriel, and, and he says, look, there will be a period of, 60, of, of, of 70 weeks, and a week in Daniel's prophecy is a period of seven years. A biblical year in the time of the Old Testament, and still until today in the Jewish calendar, is consisted of 360 days, which is because we are following the lunar calendar. So 70 weeks is 70 times, 7 times, 360 days. Now, Daniel was given the exact day he should start counting. And he said, the archangel tell, told him, from the, from the moment the decree is given to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And we know that he was given in Nehemiah chapter 2. It was given in the year 445 B.C. by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah. You start counting. And now look what he said. He said something very interesting. He said, 7 and 62 will have to pass until Messiah will come come and be cut off for something he never did. And then the city of Jerusalem has to be destroyed. 7 and 62 is 69. 69 times 360 days is 173,880 days. We know exactly the moment and the day and the month and the year Jesus entered into Jerusalem and declared himself for the first time he allowed his disciples to say that he is the Messiah. Remember, all the times before he told them, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. It's not the time yet. Don't tell anyone. You know, Matthew 16, Caesarea Philippi, don't tell anyone. Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration, don't tell anyone. This is not the time yet. But when the time came and the day came, he said to the Pharisees, if they will not speak out, the stones are going to cry out. The day, the entrance of the prince, of the coming prince, right there as he entered on April of 32 AD. And then, of course, you see, after 69 weeks, another week, is awaited, awaiting to, to take place. You see, Daniel was given a vision that is the, completely separating the 69 from the last one. Because Daniel is a prophet. You have to understand, prophets are people that are not speaking the way they want from their mind, their interpretation. They receive a vision from God. And prophets are people <laughs> that see mountaintops. But you know how many times you climb the mountain and you realize, oops, it's not the end. Actually, there's a valley and there's a higher place. You can't see the valleys. But what he couldn't see is the whole valley of the church era in which we live today. But he could see that there will be another week at the very end, the 70th week. The 70th week starts with the rapture of the church after the restrainer is removed, the Antichrist is revealed. Three and a half years, he is testing the world. For three and a half years, he's going to do hor horrible things to, to people. And of course, then comes the second coming of Jesus with us, exactly seven years after. And then comes, starts the Millennial Kingdom. And at, at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, everything is going to be eternal. Either you go to eternal life in the new Jerusalem or you go to eternal life in the lake of fire. By the way, there's no death. What happened to death? Death was casted into the lake of fire. Death and Hades were casted into the... People will not die. 
they will be, unfortunately, in a place of the gnashing of the teeth. It's a place where you wish you could die. That's why the whole theory of secession is not biblical. And so, what nation is this prophecy is all about? Israel. What city is this prophecy all about? Jerusalem. And what is the vision? Is the 70 weeks vision. The 7 weeks, 62 weeks, and of course, the 1 week. We know that it's a 490 years period, but it is divided to the first uh, 7 and 62, and then, and then, of course, the last one. What is the starting point? We all know the starting point had to be when both the temple and the city of Jerusalem were ordered to be rebuilt. And, of course, there were several Babylonians and Persian kings that gave the decree, but none of them gave the decree for the temple and for the city, but Artaxerxes in 445 B.C., who allows Nehemiah to rebuild the city of Jerusalem in Nehemiah 2, 5 to 8. So Daniel 9, 25 is the starting point in Nehemiah 2. That's 445 B.C. And Daniel said, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. So as you can see, seven weeks and 62 are 483 years, as you can clearly see here. 483 years in biblical years is actually 476 in solar year of today. Sir Robert Anderson was the assistant commissioner for crime of the London Metropolitan Police from 1888 to 1901. He wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And this is the man who understood that Nehemiah chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 9 gives us the tools to understand exactly the day of the entrance of Jesus to Jerusalem in his triumphal entry on that Palm Sunday. And that's the book he wrote, The Coming Prince. I urge you, if you can put your hand on it, to read it. It is quite amazing. And that's how he came with a calculator, 69 times 7 times 360. He got 173,890 days. And then, of course, if 1,260 days are three and a half years, then a year is 360 days. And, of course, we know in Revelation how it separates the tribulation into the first half and the second half. The two witnesses will be in the first half, 1,260 days, and then they're going to be removed. The second half is when 144,000 will, will you know, come out of the tribes of Israel and they will start giving their testimony. And, of course, that's the time Israel is going to be kept in Revelation 12 from the Antichrist that won't kill it, and they will be ready for the return of Jesus on earth. So who is going to change their address? You see, the second coming of Jesus is that we're coming back to our old address. In the rapture, we are going to change our address. Jesus said in John 14 that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is coming soon to take us out of here to be with him. And then he will return to earth to reign. We will return to earth to reign with him. In Romans chapter 13 says, And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation, the salvation of the body, is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. The volcanoes are erupting. Nation is rising against nation. People against people. Famines and pestilences. Wars and rumors of wars. 
Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and let us walk properly as in the day, not in reverie and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill his lust. And I will conclude the message with this last topic, and that's kingdom now. There is a whole movement called kingdom now. They are preparing the world for the kingdom of God. They are sent to prepare it. Aside from the Bible, world history does not agree with kingdom now interpretation of even Daniel's dream. Jesus came during the Roman Empire, so we know that Jesus' first coming is not the stone that was crushing the feet because the Roman Empire is the legs. If you look at what Daniel said in his dream, look at that big statue that he saw and see that each one, each part of the statue, if we can have it on the screen, you can see the statue of the dream of Daniel. This is the dream that he, of Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel was, was interpreting, of course. And he has a, there's a head of gold, which is Babylon, belly and thighs brass, which is Greek, the meads were in between them in the breast and arms uh, made of silver. Then the, we see that the legs are the iron of Rome. And then the feet are the divided nations, which we believe of what was used to be part of the Roman Empire then. And Jesus in his second coming, he is the rock. He is the stone. He is the God of heaven forever. And he will smash not the Roman Empire in the past, not the Babylonians in the past, but the future divided, horrible proponent of the Antichrist kingdom. He will crush to pieces. Jesus referenced the prophecies of Daniel as future, and he lived under, of course, the Roman Empire. So not speaking of those days at the time, of course. Therefore, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Jesus is speaking of a future event. Whoever reads, let him understand. Jesus spoke of the kingdom in the future tense during his own ministry. In Matthew 6, our Father is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Jesus is saying, your kingdom come. We're not to bring his kingdom here uh, by our own means. Your kingdom come and your will be done, of course, on earth as it in heaven. Jesus will come back and he will establish the kingdom of God on earth by physically sitting on the throne. It's only after the events of the tribulation that John sees the kingdom being established, matching the prophecies of the Old Testament. In Revelation 11, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He, what? Shall reign forever and ever. Future tense. What we see now, all the kingdoms, will become his kingdom when he will come back and reign forever. There is a new apostolic reformation movement that is claiming that there are specific people that are called to prepare this place for the coming of Jesus. And is it biblical? Of course not. When it was the day he called his disciples himself and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Look, there are apostles today, but they are not the apostles of the first century that were there to establish the church and to write even the scriptures. These are the people. And of course, in 1 Corinthians 9, am I not an apostle? Paul is asking, am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? The apostles of the first century, their requirement, if they wanted to be the foundation of the church, is that they had to have seen Jesus in their own life. Are you not my work in the Lord? After that, he was seen by James, 
than by all the apostles. Jesus' revelation was final. There is no new revelation. Folks, Jesus said, don't let anyone add anything to this book. If anyone will subtract or will add, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. Jude 3, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you and exhorting you to content earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Revelation 22, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And I will finish with, one ver with the three, four verses from 1 Thessalonians 5 as an exhortation to all. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test all things. Test all things. Look, Christians are like sponges. But so many times the enemy is attacking us. How? Not from the world, but from church venues or from Christian supposedly literature or from some people traveling and, and teaching some false doctrines. And, and, and then people fall in, into those terrible doctrines. He says, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. By the way, how can we be sanctified? Jesus said, sanctify them how? In the truth, by the truth, your word is true, he said. There's only one way we can be sanctified, is by the word of God. Sanctify it completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who, call, who called you is faithful, who also will do it. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the blessed hope of your return. Not, not first to stand on Mount of Olives and judge the world, but actually to take us to be with you. To be in those mansions that you've been working on for almost 2,000 years. And Father, we thank you that we are not destined to the wrath of God. We thank you that you promised that if we persevere, you will take us out of the hour of trial that is about to come upon this world. Father, we thank you that we have that hope of the soon appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds to take us to be with him, to meet him in the air. And of course, the most important thing from that moment on, we shall always be with him. So we thank you for this hope. We thank you for this promise. Because he who promised is faithful. And we ask that you will help us not to fall into false doctrines. Not to fall into stuff that is not scriptural. To test all things. And to only hold on and keep those that are good. Father, we thank you for new life. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the leadership of this church. We thank you that you installed in them the desire and the hunger to always be close to your word and to teach your word to your children. I thank you, Father, and I bless your name this morning. In the name of the Holy One of Israel, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah who first came as the Lamb of God, Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace, in the name of Yeshua, our salvation, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.